correctly. So just a reminder, um, uh, other than that, um, Clint has got a title here for us, Food Allergy, a 2021 Update, Immunologic Principles and Diagnosis. So it's all yours. I'll take over from here. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, my name's Clint. I'm one of the second year fellows. Um, I am going to try my best to do the, the big topic of food allergy. Um, for, for the new year. Uh, a lot of big publications have come out um, in the last three or four months, and we'll try to talk our way through that for um, the practicing clinician uh, and what kind of implications that that can have. Um, I'm supposed to remind everyone, please mute your microphones and uh, we'll get this rolling. And so hopefully we'll try to find enough time to get through everything. Um, so I have no disclosures. Um, our goal for today, we're going to try to get into the, the recent updates um, in the last uh, about four months since November. Um, there's been a food allergy or peanut allergy specific practice parameter that's come out, uh, as well as primary prevention for food allergies. Um, and we're going to kind of talk through a lot of the, the recent updated literature on testing uh, and the validity of some of those, those means. Um, so we're going to focus really targetedly uh, in on IgE mediated food allergy. So uh, not non IgE mediated food allergy. We're not going to talk about uh, T cell mediated allergy. We're not going to talk about eosinophilic esophagitis or eosinophilic GI disease. Um, we are not going to talk about uh, F pies or anything like that. I will try my best to keep it to FDA approved diagnostic and therapeutic options. Um, and if we do have time, and I apologize if I do go long, uh, we will try to uh, touch on what I've been working on in the last uh, almost eight months uh, for my fellowship project to, to kind of talk about what we are trying to work on. Um, so these are the big publications that have come out. Both of them were, were kind of headlined by the group um, in Colorado, but they were uh, pretty important publications that I think that we all need to be aware of. Uh, I'll talk through most of them. Um, and kind of the literature, the evidence that supports different things, but it's very rare that you have uh, consensus articles that comes out from the Quad AI, from the college, uh, from the Canadian Society, so a united North American contingency, uh, as well as a practice parameter pretty shortly um, in time frame between the two. Um, we're gonna talk about the, the major things, so prevention, genetics, introduction, how to do all of that as best as we can, the diagnosis and testing uh, and then treatment options. Um, I'm not gonna touch on things that are in the pipeline. Um, uh, I know that we have an upcoming lecture, I believe with um, Dr. Petroni or some of the other uh, excellent research side of uh, clinical research side that is gonna talk about um, what's becoming available. Uh, we'll only talk about kind of what is available at this time. So, um, the, the quad AI in the college uh, wanted to try to define what is the highest risk. So I think this is an important place for us to start and we'll kind of spin off a lot of these and, and examine the literature uh, to try to answer these questions. So um, they astutely, as all of us clinicians have seen, uh, advocated that infants with severe eczema are at the highest risk for developing food allergies um, than secondary or an increased risk. So there's high risk, there's medium risk and there's standard risk. Uh, appears to be that it could be a culmination of factors. So it could be more than one. Uh, it could be a sol solitary one. So mild, moderate eczema, uh, family history of A2P in one or both parents, uh, infants with one or known food allergy um, uh, appear to be at an increased risk, uh, but it can develop spontaneously with no identifiable risk factors. There's no evidence to clearly support that the younger sibling is at increased risk with the caveat of a lot of these studies are confounded. When you look at family studies, uh, the biggest and most important thing that we don't always acknowledge is the parents' uh, hesitancy for uh, reintroduction or, or for early introduction for the sibling of a patient that is affected. Um, and so when we look at kind of who is at risk, uh, this the chart down in the lower right um, is one of the most kind of, it's been held up. Um, I know it's small and I apologize. Uh, but it, it kind of puts it into tiers. Um, so severe eczema is probably the highest tier. Another food allergy. So if you have egg allergy, your risk for peanut allergy or subsequent allergies is higher. Uh, and then kind of going down further down uh, with family history or mild or moderate. The challenge with a lot of these, um, with a lot of 
the parameters that you put into practice, um, honestly, is, is what's defining severe uh, eczema. So what's de defining severe atopic dermatitis? There is a difference in definitions whenever you actually go back and read any of the literature. So um, the, the NIAID put out the 2017 addendum uh, a couple of years back and tried to define what is eczema and what puts them at an increased risk. Uh, and then we also look at the LEAF data, which is what most of us kind of hang our hat on a lot of time, which was a very groundbreaking study. But um, really, the, the definitions are not universal. It's not something that uh, we all use the exact same definition. So kind of acknowledging what the definition is and going forward. So for the LEAP, they did kind of choose a little bit more of an arbitrary um, a little bit more of an arbitrary system, but they kind of hung their hat at the very end on the score ad, which is the scoring of atopic dermatitis. Uh, it's a scoring system based on surface area, extent, uh, erythema, excoriations. Um, it's not always done clinically, but it is something that can be of use. So they defined severe atopic dermatitis um, as a rash that requires topical application containing corticosteroid or calcineurin inhibitors um, and that lasts at least uh, 12 of 30 days on two occasions for those that are less than six months and then greater for for those that are greater than six months uh, it's present 12 of 30 days on two occasions uh, in the past six months so it has to show some level of chronicity so at least um, 24 days total in the last six months um, in depending on the age it kind of changes all of this was described by the guardian of the child for the rash so uh, it was not a um, doesn't have to be a clinician diagnosis, but they did try to have a current score ad at the time of entry uh, greater than 40. And then the NIA, uh, NIAID changed it a little bit just to say that they had they wanted persistent, frequent, recurring rash with typical morphology for atopic dermatitis and uh, distribution uh, assessed by severity of a healthcare professional. Uh, I'm sorry, assessed as severe by a healthcare professional and requiring frequent need for topical therapy. Um, and, and so I think that the uh, NIAID tried to make it a little bit more standardized, try to put it more in the clinician's hands. Uh, and that's where a lot of the literature is moving more towards where um, we are the ones that kind of judge it as severe um, and kind of uh, assessing it in that sense. And then the other food allergies that appear to be most correlated, especially at a young age, just because they're at higher risk in that population uh, are egg and milk. The question on genetic factors, we'll, we'll come to in the next slide, um, remains a, a question that we don't fully have uh, an answer to. Um, and especially when we're talking about prevention, um, which is sometimes before we are actually meeting these patients, which is, is sometimes done by the primary care doctors, um, it, it really is the accumulation of factors. So uh, not necessarily just the fact that the child has atopic dermatitis, but um, atopic dermatitis in the child plus severe allergic rhinitis in the parents plus uh, you know, sibling or personal history of food allergy may have a larger bearing uh, on everything than anything than any single factor alone. Um, so a lot has come out in the last year about the genetics uh, for different forms of allergies. So uh, for asthma as well as for um, as well as for eczema, uh, and food allergy and trying to find the association. So we know about the atopic march. We know the typical progression that we see. And so they've done a lot of um, candidate gene association studies where they look at specifically affected populations that have either progressed through the, the atopic march or they look at um, individuals with a specific phenotype. So a specific food allergy, they test them, they, they see what high risk alleles there are and they look at the general population and they try to determine um, are those really risk factors alleles? Uh, the challenge with a lot of the genetic side is um, they we try to interpret everything as causative. So what kind of started, what, what started it all? The, the interesting thing is, is the environment does appear to have the most important role in this. And there are studies that are coming out and showing that um, which we're looking at like genome wide association or, or linked some of the, the other interesting factors that play into not just the, the genes that they have, the high risk alleles that they have, but also kind of going forward from there to try to extrapolate what really does put someone at higher risk. Um, the, the level of evidence for specific genes kind
kind of goes back and forth. Some of them ha do have higher risk odds ratios, um, not risk, sorry, I apologize, odds ratios, uh, comparing them to other specific uh, um, genes. And so these are the highest ones that kind of have crossover for all of them. If you really look at it, um, the ones that, uh, sorry, I apologize, I was covering my microphone for a second. Um, the ones that probably bear out the most when you look at the literature are ones that we all are, are relatively aware of and it makes sense to the clinician. Um, interrupt you for a second. I think you have to speak up a little bit louder. I apologize. I did cover my microphone. Um, so some of them make some of the, the most likely genes that have been identified make a lot of sense because they're associated with the atopic march and especially with um, atopic dermatitis as being the initiator. So the flagrin gene uh, that has been well documented is, is if you have a loss of function uh, that affects the, the skin development or the, the complex that differentiates into the epidermal layer that creates a barrier defect can then go on to have an increased risk for atopic disease. The odds ratios of that are not significantly elevated. So it's in the two to five range. So it is elevated, but usually you talk about greater than 10 as being significantly uh, elevated risk. Uh, HLA class two genes, so important for antigen presentation to, to helper T cells have been associated with it, specifically DQ and DR. Um, they are definitely more, uh, ethnicity specific. So uh, specific ethnicities that have higher risk uh, HLA types do appear to have more association with atopic disease. The, it doesn't appear to affect the long-term morbidity mortality. It does not appear to affect uh, treatment responses. It's just more one of those things of antigen presentation is important in that, uh, and it may kind of affect the, the kind of progression along. The ones that are probably the most interesting as it will probably drive therapies are kind of the ones that are below. So MALT1, uh, it's in the complex for uh, NF-kappa B activation. So it is a regulatory protein. It's more present in the GI tract. Um, and if we have uh, deficiencies or, or loss of functions of that gene, uh, the odds ratios are in the 10 to 11 range uh, compared to normal controls that are healthy and do not have those for their progression to atopic disease, specifically food allergies. And so um, those probably explain a little bit more of why, of how the common kind of dual exposure hypothesis makes a little bit more sense where if you have a deficiency in the GI tract for antigen processing, that they may have an increased risk for development of food allergies. The ones below um, are very, very ethnicity specific, but I think they're important to acknowledge. So STAT6 uh, is involved in the IL-4, IL-13 uh, pathway from the receptor. Um, and so the reason that that may have a, a role is specifically for therapeutics. Um, and then SPINK5 is predominantly in the J uh, Japanese cohort. It's similar to flagrin. It's important in keratinocyte differentiation and development. And then IL-10, TGF-beta are protective uh, inflammatory, uh, anti-inflammatory cytokines um, that are more common in the non-European population. So the, just be aware the genetics are there, but they're not yet driving, um, they're not yet driving therapeutics at this time. Uh, it's more of a, they may have an increased risk for specific presentations um, similar to what we think about for atopic dermatitis. Um, the challenge with a lot of this is, you know, we know that environment probably plays the most important factor in all of this. And if we can control the environment, if we can keep the skin barrier, it's probably associated with that. The exception may be malt, malt one. So the big question for all of the guidelines, when you go, at, go back and actually look at it, there was a big disagreement between the different societies. So the uh, NIAID, the British Society, uh, and the Australian Society all took the concept of early introduction in a very different different kind of direction. Uh, the NIAID did a lot of risk stratification. So the high risk infants, severe eczema, other food allergy, they said introduce it four to six months. Uh, if you have moderate risk or intermediate risk, um, then you have to do six months. And then if you're standard risk, just do any time, uh, sometime in six to 12 months. The British society was a little bit more, uh, I don't wanna say wishy-washy. They didn't make as, as 
estimate of a time. So they said, you know, they wanted to encourage breastfeeding. They wanted to make sure that early introduction was prioritized because they knew that delayed introduction past the six to 12 months um, was important, uh, but it didn't kind of say like a hardline rule of like, this is when we should introduce. And then the Australian society was um, probably the most cavalier based on the literature from the health nuts, uh, try, uh, health nuts study that was pretty, um, pretty much just say, give it to them anytime, uh, at least by six months, just give it to them regularly, introduce it without screening, it'll be okay. And because of that disagreement, there was a lot of clinicians that were left hanging where we didn't have a great guidepost on when and how and what do we recommend to our parents or our patients. Um, and so the, the new updated parameter as far as introduction prevention, um, and it's mainly because the literature is most robust and most interested in looking at peanut and egg. So bearing that in mind that there is a bias towards those studies having been done um, is that peanut and egg should be introduced in all individuals irrespective of risk by six months of life, but not before four months is to affect breastfeeding. Uh, this can be done at home when developmentally ready, but not before infant demonstrates developmental readiness with other starter foods, uh, which is an important thing, and I'll mention that in a second. Uh, screening via skin prick or IgE and or in-office introduction is not recommended, but remains an option to consider for families that prefer not to introduce at home um, as a way to develop preference-sensitive partnership. Uh, they strongly encourage either home introduction or offering supervised oral food challenge for any positive skin prick test or IgE result. Uh, once introduced, regular ingestion should be maintained. Uh, so this evidence is a uh, grade A uh, as far as all of it is. It's very little biased, and we'll kind of go into why. Um, uh, why the the couple of quick things just to kind of go over at the very at the top end, especially because um, having a, having a young child myself, uh, it's hard to develop to understand when developmental readiness uh, is is present. Um, and kind of trying to time it. So the biggest and most important thing that they all, all the guidelines make, want to make sure is that there's some level of starter foods that could be uh, rice cereal, oatmeal, anything like that, that uh, enables them to be comfortable with head control, being able to sit up, being able to ingest as in, in a way so that you don't confound the issue of if they started vomiting, if they got a little bit of skin rash, is it related to the weather, they have sensitive skin, or is it related to the food? So they recommend that these are not the first foods, but more after starter foods have been initiated. Um, and we'll kind of cover that a little bit more. Um, these are the big trials that we all are aware of. Um, there was another one that was concluded and published at the end of, I think it was 2019. And I'll, I'll talk about that on the next slide. Uh, the most robust literature has focused on peanut and egg uh, with very little attention to the other allergens outside of those two. And when you look at the data, they are not in the typical populations that it's there. Very few of them are in all comers and the evidence as far as the statistics behind it do not always bear out. And so I think it's important for us to acknowledge which ones are we going to, are we going to try to progress and try to advocate for uh, and which ones we are going to try to follow. So everyone cites the LEAP trial. LEAP trial was um, a good randomized clinical control. Uh, it was in high-risk infants, uh, so they had to have a score add greater than 40. Uh, they had to eat at least six grams per week of peanut protein versus complete av avoidance uh, through the age of five, and they had to have ig mediated peanut allergy based on oral food challenge at five years old. It showed dramatic uh, intention to treat uh, in the attention to treat analysis showed dramatic um, reduction in the rates of peanut allergy. But whenever it came to a lot of the other clinical trials for egg specifically, the literature went back and forth. So we all agree after reading or looking at the LEAP trial, the peanut in early introduction makes sense. It works. We want to make sure we prioritize that. But when we looked at a lot of the egg um, early introduction in different risk populations of standard risk, high risk, intermediate risk. Um, these are kind of the eat, the star, the step, the beat, the heap trial. And I'll come to the, the pettit because I think that's probably um, the most robust um, and it's probably the most comparable to the LEAP trial. Um, very few of them 
were able to actually show clinical significance in the intention to treat. The EAT trial did show um, in the in, in the parameter analysis uh, less prevalence of peanut and egg um, in the ex early exposure group. So those kids that ate at least two grams uh, twice weekly or three times weekly of peanut, cooked egg, cow milk, sesame, white fish, but they didn't show it for any other um, any other individuals. So those are so early introduction received it four to six months. Standard received it at least after six months. Um, and so they they concluded that in peanut and egg, it makes sense, but the other ones, it may not have the benefit that we know of. Um, a lot of it comes down to what is the right dose? And I don't think we know that yet. Uh, the Pettit trial out of Japan had 120 subjects. It's the bottom of the slide. Um, it What they did is they took high-risk in infants with atopic dermatitis, uh, plus or minus a family history, and they brought them in. They challenged them at the beginning, um, and then they re-challenged them at the end at uh, 12 months. And so what they wanted to look at is what was the prevalence of egg allergy um, in those that had daily consumption uh, versus they had uh, avoidance. And so they actually tiered the amount. So similar to what you would think of for any child that's going to eat a f their first food is they, they kind of started out at a lower dose because their appetite was a little bit less robust and they stepped them up um, progressively to higher dose. So it started at 50 milligrams of heated egg and they stepped it up to 250 milligrams of heated egg from nine to 12 months. And they looked at how that affected um, egg allergy compared to avoidance. And it did cause a pretty robust reduction. So a reduction from 37 to 8.3. So those are, whenever it comes to the literature for egg and peanut, it does look like early introduction is important. It does look like um, specifically for peanut, we all can get behind that. There, there may be some questions about the, the dosing uh, is it six grams? Can we get away with two grams? Can we get away with everything? Uh, and then as far as egg, I think that we don't know the specific amount, but it does look like uh, early introduction does kind of bear out if you take a step back and look at it. When we talk about the other foods, um, we know the risk for delaying introductions. We know that for cow milk, soy, wheat, tree nuts, sesame, fish and shellfish, that if we avoid them, it will progress us to um, to food allergy. So they do. Sh so the practice parameters and uh, the consensus guideline do strongly encourage uh, introduction of these uh, potentially allergenic complementary foods. Um, sometime in that, not as early as four, but sometime between four to six months, but before twelve months. Um, testing is not required, even in the high-risk individuals. Um, and then oral food challenge should be con considered in all uh, positive results. And I'll, I'll get to that in a second as well. Um, and the reason that these don't have as strong of data behind them is, number one, we haven't looked. Um, and I think that's a big thing that we're going to start looking more at you know, other food allergies, not just uh, peanut and egg. Um, but the... Um, the, the introduction of these foods, fish, shellfish, usually do occur later anyways, compared to egg and, and milk, um, as those are more common early introduced foods uh, in the forms of yogurts and, and hard boiled eggs or scrambled eggs or anything like that. Um, really the only robust literature that I could find um, for any of these alternative foods uh, or other allergenic foods was the SPADE trial. SPADE was the, it's called the strategy for prevention of milk allergy by daily ingestion of infant formula in early infancy. So it's a randomized control trial um, where in the first one to two months of life, they had uh, the children ingest at least 10 mLs of cow's milk-based formula uh, in addition to breastfeeding versus avoidance of cow's milk formula, use of soy formula or exclusive breastfeeding. Uh, and then they did a oral challenge to cow's milk uh, to diagnose cow's milk allergy. Their rates in the active group were, um, it was remarkably low. So two in 242 in the active group had uh, challenge positive cow's milk allergy compared to placebo that had 17, um, which is a percentage of 6.8% of the population. Considering the fact that um, cow's milk allergy in the general population in this age range is one to 2%. The 6.8% the in the placebo group is a very strikingly high percentage. Um, and then the 
population that was used in this trial was not the most, it was very heterogeneous. Um, I'm sorry, it was very homogeneous. So it was, uh, it was not the most generalizable, but it, it does appear that similar to what we see for egg in peanut is that early introduction may actually have a role, um, but there's still a lot more data for other foods outside of peanut and egg um, compared to, to other food allergies. Um, Clint, can I interrupt you for a second? Go for it. Uh, two things. One, keep your voice up. But um, I'm curious. I'm not a pediatrician. I don't um, see enough kids with food allergy. Since we've had the LEAP study the longest and the data for that are exceedingly strong, has anybody analyzed a, in a formal way how successful that's been in changing yeah, and have what, what society has actually done with that information? Um, I am actually going to come up to that next, but that is a great question. Um, and so, so I'm going to make sure I answer that question on this slide. Is that okay, Dr. Yeah. Allman? Yeah. Um, because it, it actually has been shown to be beneficial. Um, so at least as far as other countries, so Britain, uh, the Great Britain has seen kind of leveling off of their rates of peanut allergy. So while um, over the last 10 years, we kind of have had a progressive increase in the incidence of peanut allergy. Great Britain has started to see it kind of leveled off. The United States hasn't fully seen it um, level off. It still is slightly increasing. Um, but in other countries, such as Australia, uh, it, has, it has done that. And I will, I will mention that in a second. Um, actually, I'll just mention it right now. So um, the early nuts, which was a, a spinoff of the health nuts uh, large cohort in Australia showed that the consumption in this age range, so the four to six month old infants pre the LEAP trial uh, following the AAP and, and the, I think it was the 2014 guidelines that had said to avoid it until two. Um, after the LEAP trial, the consumption, the percentage that was consuming peanut went from 28 to 30% up into the 80s to 90s. So we are doing we are getting across the goal of of more broad uh ingestion more broad adherence to this uh there still is a lot of barriers to uh introduction in, in the united states so there was a a group out of um colorado who surveyed parents at six month mark um and about 36 percent of parents still had a concern of uh, a reaction even with no history that was suggestive of A2P uh, that was not concerning um, for a family history or anything else, but they still had a, about a third of the parents were hesitant to introduce. 11% uh, had concerns for choking, um, and then about 6% still felt there was no infant safe forms of peanut or other nuts available to them. And 48% wanted more discussion with their doctor before doing early introduction. Um, so we still have a long way in working with our colleagues um, in primary care uh, to kind of get these patients to have earlier introduction. Uh, it's not just on us, it is on them as well. Um, but uh, we, are, we are showing that there is an increase in people ingesting it in other countries just based on this. Um, the question then becomes how much? Um, so it's all well and good if we can get them to, to start ingesting it. And that and frequency probably does make the most sense and, and maybe the most important step in, um, in all of this is evidenced by some of the things like the LEAP trial versus the, the PETIT trial, which is the prevention of egg allergy in high-risk infants with eczema um, in Japan. So the interesting thing about all of them, so LEAP set the goal of six grams weekly, so two grams three times a week, uh, but their median amount was about seven and a half or 7.7 .7 grams per week per individual. Um, as they got in that uh, four to 11, four to 12 months. Um, and then the EAT trial targeted around two grams per week. Um, and then the Pettit for egg at least was 50 milligrams for the first, 50 milligrams per day for the first six to nine months or for the first three months starting at six months. And then 250 uh, milligrams per day starting in that nine to 12 months. Um, and, and once again, we, the frequency that they, that we introduce and regularly give it to the patients is probably the most important. Um, but, and just so that we all kind of are aware of what's out there. So there's, um, there's two major forms of getting these early introductions and 
the easiest for most parents or the, probably the least expensive as the conventional food introduction. So that's peanut butter, cooked egg, scrambled eggs, um, nut butters, if they're able to make it. Uh, it does require parents to actually give this. And as, as Dr. Altman kind of alluded to, there still is a level of fear. Um, and, and that was within the last year where they, they looked at parents that had six month olds that not just in, not just because of COVID, but just because of, you know, they had concerns about a fear of reaction. And so 36%, we're not gonna give um, highly allergenic foods um, until they were closer to a year old just because they were concerned. Um, and so then what kind of has started to come out uh, is some commercially available products. Uh, they're in the forms of puffs or powders. They are able to be mixed in to uh, infant foods. So they're able to be added to uh, oatmeal or they're, they're added to um, pureed foods. And so they're able to kind of be a little bit more convenient. They can come in the form of solitary allergens or multiple allergens, uh, and they're able to uh, they're able to kind of get an exposure in a smaller amount. There is a varying quality uh, and there's varying um, price as far as all of these goes. So there's some that are you can buy most of these for a monthly fee, um, and they range from two milligrams of allergen protein to two grams uh, per serving. Um, they are much more convenient because they're a smaller quantity for them to actually be able to ingest all of that, uh, the, all of that protein. Um, they do not have product specific evidence. There, a lot of them are working on it. So some of the, the ones that um, are available uh, to our patients just so that we are aware of them are things like Hello Peanut, Little Mix-Ins, uh, which has egg, tree nut mix, so which is almonds, pistachios, hazelnuts, walnuts. Um, there's a Mighty Me Puff, um, there's Ready Set Food is one that's I know that people have heard of and Spoonful One, um, which both can have, um, they have it broken down into um, at least Ready Set Food has a milk specific one, a peanut specific one and an egg specific one. Um, and then Spoonful One has all of the major allergens that you can actually get. So you can get milk, egg, wheat, soy, sesame, peanut, tree nuts, fish, including salmon and cod uh, and shellfish in a powder. Um, these range from about about 20 bucks per month uh, to about 50 or $60 per month. Um, and you can get a recurring service so that it can be shipped directly to you. Um, and there are a lot of parents that are moving in, in this direction. The challenge is teasing out which of them could have potentially triggered a reaction, uh, which does cause us problems. And then um, one of the things that, that a lot of these, they don't have the evidence specifically, they're extrapolating it off of um, the LEAP trial or the EAT trial uh, and saying, well, if it was safe for that population, then it should be good for you. Um, and they don't have it based on risk. Um, so it is something to be aware of. Probably something that we'll hear about in the next couple of years uh, is the importance of diet diversity. And by that, I mean, not just when we're introducing certain foods, but what number of foods. So um, we know that in observational data only, bearing that in mind, so individuals that ingest zero to three foods are at higher risk of food allergy, uh, or at least twice the risk of those that are eating four to six uh, food groups. And um, it kind of leads towards the thought process of, you know, if you can get a diverse, uh, diverse diet, a kind of a regular consumption, that it may uh, lead to food, to fewer food allergies. It's not known why that is specifically the case, but it is observationally that those that are ingesting different types of foods um, actually have less food allergies. And so uh, the biggest thing that if you read those earlier slides and what they're uh, recommending for uh, egg and peanut is a, a not screening for any risk stratification, uh, mainly because we know that atopic dermatitis skin is not normal uh, in any way. And they wanted to try to look at what was the, you know, the cost, the societal cost uh, that we have to bear in mind. So it, compared to the number of uh, allergic reactions per year and kind of a discussion on the risk for a parent, the risk for a patient, and kind of them having a shared decision making to, to make that decision. Um, and it really is not as, as so on an individual basis, it is not a, a huge cost swing, or it doesn't seem like a huge cost swing. So if you see at the top for, for peanut allergy, um, no screening, the cost per patient at risk is 
uh, or for higher risk is about six and a half thousand dollars. Whereas if we skin test everybody, it goes up about a thousand dollars, which matters if we're screening, you know, hundreds of thousands uh, of individuals, but it may not matter on an individual basis as much. We know that delayed introduction does matter. Um, and then um, we know that for siblings, unless you have a very high risk uh, of sibling Ex siblings having the exact same food allergy in, the, in a model, and it's important I say model because it's not, uh, this is not based on clinical data. This is based on extrapolations of computer models that say that um, unless your percentage is above 11% for a sibling history uh, and the parents are not going to um, provide or, or introduce that food, uh, testing is still not recommended. Um, but it is a 700 roughly $700 per patient uh, increased uh, for, for screening. And the reason that a lot of these studies have done this is looking at what is, what is, what is anaphylaxis or what is an allergic reaction in a young patient versus an older patient. Um, and it's mainly because infantile anaphylaxis, or, and let me define that term. So it's a kid less than 24 months. Some studies will say 12 months, but most studies are kind of supporting the less than 24 months do not have a systemic allergic reaction the same as older kids. And so a lot of this was after, based off of um, examination of data for presentation to the ER uh, for allergic reactions or to an allergist office uh, over in uh, Hopkins and, and up in um, Philadelphia, where they were looking at what is the most common symptom. So it's most commonly cutaneous or gastrointestinal in this age range. The most common severe symptom is CNS depression, so sleepiness, which can be hard to differentiate in a child where are they sleepy because they didn't nap and we were in the ER for four hours, or is it because I gave them Benadryl, or is it because it's actually a sequela of uh, this reaction? And so they looked at the data and they said that about 70% 70 70 of infants less than 24 months after an exposure to a positive sensitized food had a mild reaction as deemed by a clinical allergist in 70% of the time. 18% had moderate symptoms and 11% had severe. Um, compared to older children who, who, when they presented to the ER, would have a, a severe rate in the 30s, which is also very high when you actually look at the, the literature. Um, and that's why they said that it appears to be safer. They also showed that they, had, they were less likely to have respiratory, and by that they described bronchospasm uh, or anything involving the respiratory tree or cardiovascular collapse uh, in less than 1% of patients. Uh, and then in the health nuts uh, and other studies, they showed that there was a zero or up to a 2% uh, incidence of biphasic reactions. Um, and it probably benefits because of an Im immature immune system. Uh, they showed, and you can see it in the bottom part, th these numbers are not, the, the power of these studies are not remarkable, but it's more of just an interesting anecdote um, to kind of look at the people who would, would be considered positive, so have a three millimeter or greater skin prick, uh, have about a 50% chance of passing it. Um, the left side, the study is, I think it was seven patients, and the other side, I think it was 20, 22 were greater than seven millimeters. So not huge numbers that you can really hang your hat on and say, yep, these are, let's all, you know, challenge a lot of them, and we'll kind of get into that. But they did show that in kiddos that, um, that were in the nine to 36 month range, because they still had some, some plasticity, if we were able to get peanut introduction, either in the form of OIT or regular consumption, um, even if they were uh, positive on the onset, 78% had sustained responsiveness at least four weeks after discontinuing oral immunotherapy. Um, so essentially you have prevented them from progression and actually reversed the, the food allergy, which is something that could be potentially important. Um, so I'm gonna transition now from prevention to diagnosis. So um, this is where I think the practice parameters get a little bit more uh, challenging for me specifically for the, the average clinician. So um, just like we all know for food allergy, clinical history is, remains the most important. So clinical history is the most important and then oral challenge um, is the gold standard for confirmation and should be considered at any point for food allergy, um, even with a positive result, as long as the risk associated to the patient is deemed low enough uh, that a, the benefit of passing it and preventing a lifelong allergy is important. Um, obviously, in the COVID era where we have to bring patients in, it, it ties up a room. It is much more of a time-consuming process and space-consuming process. It is a risk, and so there is some concern about that. Um, 
so when it comes to testing, the practice parameters have come out and said that uh, they only think that testing is warranted when there's a high enough pretest probability of allergy that, or prior to an, uh, an oral food challenge with moderate pretest that, um, that it will affect your management. But if it's low or very low, they recommend not testing. Um, and a lot of this is going to come is going to hinge on the fact of what is considered a positive test. And a positive test, in this sense, is trying to maximize the specific specificity to food allergy. So making sure that if it's positive, you know that it's it's positive. If it's negative, you know that it's negative. So that you can have you can avoid unnecessary avoidance, and then you can you don't miss people who have a true allergy. And so um, a lot of these testing modalities have not been demonstrated in kids less than two years old. And a lot of them uh, do not have the challenge data behind it to try to say like, this is this is what the, a positive test kind of correlates with. So they've tried, multiple locations have tried to, including Stanford, um, Bob Wood's group out of Hopkins and, and some of the groups overseas have tried to correlate what is the best test. And so the practice parameters, will, I'll, I'll mention what the practice parameters say, um, but whenever it comes to our modalities, we have skin prick testing, which we all know about, we all rely on every single day. It is the least uh, extensive. It relies on um, the person who applies it, the device itself, where there is some variability between each devices. Um, and um, it requires healthy, normal skin. In an atopic dermatitis patient, there is literature that shows that even, air quote, normal skin is not normal. Uh, and so that's something that's important for us to acknowledge. Um, and then the diagnostic cutoffs for what's considered a positive may need to change based on every specific food, which then makes it even more challenging for the clinician to diagnose. Serum specific IgE, formerly, those are those are things that are formerly known as RAST. They're not done as a radioabsorbent um, assay anymore. They're now done as enzyme linked uh, immunosorbent assays. Um, the positive result is considered uh, 0.35. Um, it's mainly been validated in that in children five to eight years old or in adults, uh, but we're starting to get incredibly sensitive results uh, from the labs that are coming down to a really big gray zone that is the 0.1 to 0.35 range that clinicians, we need to be aware of uh, and try to, to examine. Um, and then whenever we, whenever I say more expensive here, it's not more expensive, it's more expensive compared to skin prick testing. So um, whenever I was trying to look it up on like on some of the big lab companies, um, some of them said 15 to $40 per allergen, but whenever you factor in the blood draw fee and, every, and the processing fee, it's probably in the low 100 uh, range or a little bit less than $100. Um, and whenever we get to components, it's probably a couple of, a little over $150 for, for all the components. Um, I show this slide for a group out of, um, so the bottom right is the group out of, uh, uh, Hopkins and the top left is the group out of Stanford looking at receiver operator curves to try to minimize the the negative uh, the false negative results uh, and maximizing the true positive results um, and minimizing the false positive results and they showed that for challenge proven so they took uh, 1200 kids that had varying results on skin prick and IgE and they challenge them to every single food that they were sensitized to. And they wanted to try to correlate what was the best test for each of them. And typically on almost all of them, it's a combination. It's not necessarily uh, a single test that's gonna be the best. Um, but the, the results for skin prick testing, as you can see, are a lot higher. So they, they think that an almond cutoff of 12 for skin prick, 12 millimeters um, for skin prick test is, is what would be considered positive, whereas cashew is five, egg would be 14, and this is um, concentrated egg, not a baked egg challenge. Um, then there's hazelnut, milk, uh, peanut, and peanut, I would argue, is also pretty darn high when you look at it, where it's a skin prick test of nine, uh, and then the uh, uh, serum specific of 11, um, and then pecan, sesame, and walnut, all of them, the results are kind of in the uh, almost as high as eight or other than cashew, which is five. Um, and then the ones they go up closer to, to 15 for uh, egg. But there's not great, um, in isolation, there's not great concordance for using them. So Bob Wood's group uh, took 
all of this data combined with their own challenge data, and they said, well, if we want to have the best positive predictive value um, for cow's milk um, for different age ranges, so greater than two, less than two, um, they recommended uh, a, a 15 uh, um, kilo units per liter for, for cow's milk, uh, or skin protective greater than eight, and then for infants less than two, they said six milliliters. And it bore out in the challenges. They did have some kids that were um, less than these cutoffs that still did have an allergic reaction on a challenge, but they didn't miss any, they didn't cause unnecessary avoidance in any children with these cutoffs. Um, once again, though, if you look at the peanut specific values and the tree nut and the fish, their values are remarkably high. So their uh, serum specific is in the 20s, uh, and then for sesame is in the 50s. Um, and the peanut is 15 to 34, which um, is probably not the most ideal because it does put them in a higher risk. And the important thing to remember is this is also uh, in the controlled setting of an, of an academic center. Um, so there is still concern about that. Um, and then one of the biggest things that the practice parameters hinge their hat on is component testing. So they recommended, uh, as kind of has been going around for a while, um, is ARH2 testing. So uh, they, the, the group that wrote the practice parameters said that ARH2 in isolation uh, is the diagnostic test of choice uh, if someone is presenting for suspected peanut allergy, if only a single diagnostic test could be chosen. Uh, it has the highest diagnostic accuracy uh, as well as the most optimal positive and negative result. Unfortunately, uh, and they briefly alluded to this in, their, in the practice parameter, you can't get an isolated error H2. Uh, you have to get it in as multiples. So a part of their, their recommendation is a little bit more challenging because you can't do it in isolation. You have to do it in multiples, which means that you add up a, an extra expense. Um, but you do get a much higher specific result, depending on what positive your cutoff you're using based on different ages. And the problem with ARH2 is it also does ignore other allergens like ARH1, 3, 6, that can also be associated with clinical allergy. Um, there are some studies that show in, in kiddos in the, the four to five range that ARH2 may have a lower cumulative reactive dose. Um, but once again, it, it's, a, it's a much harder pill to swallow. Um, and then for the other components, so for tree nuts, uh, milk, uh, eggs, um, we know they, so they recommended a, a core nine of greater than one uh, and a 14 greater than five in adults or greater than one to have more association with systemic reactions. Um, and then as far as the other components, there's a lot of uncertainty, uh, specifically with milk and, and eggs um, in re relations to whether they can tolerate baked forms, whether they can tolerate uh, persistent. And so they, they give these below cutoffs um, based on what's the percentage of tolerating baked or cooked or raw uh, for milk and egg, what's the rates of, of hazelnut challenge, trying to maximize how specific and so how much, um, excuse me, <coughs> um, how much you can actually have a, a true positive result. Um, and, and they do have good data behind it, but their ranges are pretty broad. So if you look at hazelnut and peanut, a uh, positive result for their tests are 0.35 to 42, um, which is, is Honestly, it's way too wide of a range. And so it does, it does create a lot of conundrums with this. Um, there are some data in adults that say that uh, using kind of 1.75 is a little bit better. The practice parameter still kind of says the 0.35 is what, we're, what we should use. Um, so this is kind of what, in specific to peanut, uh, trying to maximize the sensitivity and specificity. Skin prick test is very sensitive but probably not very specific, which we all kind of know. Same thing with serum specific. If we use the 0.35 cutoff uh, and ARH2 is, is probably the bal most balanced. When you start using them in conjunction together is when you start to actually see a better kind of a positive likelihood ratio. And I'll show you the, the Fagan nomogram so you can understand that. Um, but if you want to try to do severe reaction predictions, this is the numbers they choose. It doesn't always bear out because as we kind of are all aware is previous reactions don't always predict future reactions and severe reactions don't always perfectly correlate with the testing. Um, so it's important for us to acknowledge that our tests are not perfect, um, but there are benefits to it. So um, we kind of can start with skin prick testing. On the left and going to the right is kind of the, the ratio of 
risk. So low risk, medium risk, high risk, whenever they come in and they're like, I would like to be tested for food allergy um, and how it will actually change your percentage. So if you have a likelihood ratio of kind of in that 1.9 to 2 range for skin prick testing based on the sensitivity and specificity, it, for the low risk and intermediate risk, it doesn't change your rate that dramatically of a clinical food allergy uh, before and after the test, so pre-test and post-test, but it does whenever you get into the high risk. So it'll go from 50% to, to closer to 80%. Same thing with serum specific, uh, where with about a, a likelihood ratio of two, uh, it'll really only kind of dramatically change your data when you're looking at um, the higher risk populations uh, or higher concerns, kind of the higher rate of pretest thinking that they actually have a peanut allergy component will kind of swing you the widest. Um, so it can go from a lower person, a lower concern and raise it up into the 50% range um, and a moderate can range you up in the, the 80 to 90% range uh, and then the, the higher risk can put you much cl much closer to a certainty. Um, something that's been around for probably over 10 years um, is the basophil activation or simulation test. It's as far as I can find it is only available from one commercial lab in the United States. It may be more available internationally. Um, it, it's a functional assay uh, that combines sensitization with evidence of basophil activation using uh, marker CD63, which shows uh, it only comes to the surface whenever you have de, uh, degranulation. Um, it is very specific. It is uh, has a better correlation with clinical reactivity to a challenge uh, specific to peanut cow's milk in the 100% to 96% range. Um, and, and same thing for other tree nuts. The problem is, number one, it's not available um, for, for most of us. And then uh, 10 to 15% of patients have basophils that are non-responders. So you can, get a, you can get a test and it can be negative, but they still clinically react. Um, and it's mainly from a research side at this point. Um, so it's something that they mentioned in the practice parameters, but it's not yet ready for prime time, I would argue. Um, Whenever we talk about prognosis for food allergy, largely this data has not changed um, yet. I think that we will probably see in five years this data changes. Um, so we know that egg and milk, uh, four out of five patients will have resolution by five years. There does not appear to be a correlation be between tolerating baked products earlier uh, versus later, but it does, but the time to resolution may be affected. Um, and then whenever it comes to peanut, it's kind of the opposite. So one out of five will actually have resolution. They do recommend serial monitoring or trending the, the testing modality, whatever is chosen, either skin prick test or serum specific. Um, but if it's unchanged, then it may, it's unlikely to change. Uh, tree nut allergy, they cited the, uh, a recent publication cited that resolution is seen in 10 to 12% of individuals. So bearing that in mind, I think that's probably a little bit high from some of the other studies that say um, the biggest, most important thing about tree nuts is a group of kids um, that are in Baltimore that are followed long longitudinally um, that are zero to two, 80% will become, will become sensitized to an additional tree nut by 14 um, if they do kind of strict avoidance. Uh, so getting them to re to introduce is probably one of the most important things. Um, Cross reactivity data is starting to come into question. So we always are taught that walnut and peanut, um, or sorry, walnut and pecan cross react. And um, that may not be the case. There may be some discordance between walnuts and pecan, but not by, not backwards. So if, if you're pecan positive, you're likely to react to walnut, but not the other way. And then the same thing with pistachio and cashew. Um, if you're cashew positive, you may actually tolerate um, pistachio, but if you're pistachio positive, you're a 95%, you're going to have a cross reactivity with cashew. So Largely, this, this data has not changed, unfortunately, but we're hopeful. Um, treatment, so avoidance remains the kind of the gold standard. There's only one FDA approved product uh, for food allergy. There's many more in the pipelines, but um, there's only been kind of one that's truly been approved. Um, and a 2012 article showed that uh, about one in, one in nine or 10 to 12.5% uh, of individuals with a known food allergy have an accidental exposure accidental in the terms of teenage boys um, and over half uh, are inadequately treated due to desire to avoid epinephrine. There is an ongoing study that during the COVID pandemic of trying to decrease sending our kids to the ER is a, a better partnership with parents uh, and families so that they can give epinephrine, observe um, at home instead of sending them to the ER. Um, 
if they don't have a history of biphasic reactions or severe reactions, but knowing that they may have to the second that those that those are potentially an option. Oral immunotherapy was approved, I believe it was February of 2020. Uh, it was either January or February. Um, it's um, for the for kiddos four to 18. It's it's not a perfect product, uh, and it's very it's for a specific patient population. The big studies were the Palisade and the Ramsey's uh, trial. Um, they showed that they showed the benefit um, that it increases the threshold of reactivity. It improves patients' anxiety, uh, and some patients did develop lasting tolerance uh, whenever they were coming off of it. But in general, it's not a cure. There were GI side effects of of taste preference kind of changing as well as um, as well as eosinophilic esophagitis. There's still questions to remain on duration of therapy. They've been studied out multiple years and it appears safe, but we don't fully know, like we know for allergen immunotherapy or shots, what is the ideal timeline um, to do all of that. Um, it does require, especially now that it's kind of becoming available, there's questions about reimbursement. And there's questions about like the right patient, the right uh, family, the right provider. And so you do have to have a pretty available physician. So it can't be where the parents call in and they get an answer 24 hours. Usually they have to have a, a, an answer pretty expeditiously and it could be in the middle of the night. Um, they have to have the physical space and the physician availability and the family availability to come in every two weeks because the first day they come in, it's, you build it like a challenge. You go from 0 0.5 milligrams of the, the product, the standardized product up to six milligrams. So accumulation of 12 milligrams. If they tolerate that, they come back the next day and they start on three milligrams and they escalate up. There was not, uh, in the CMS update in 2021, there was not a specific code for oral immunotherapy that was done. The Quad AI and the college have um, the below kind of things. Um, and so that's what they think that the first day should be a challenge uh, and the initial dosing should be an ENM code plus uh, 99354 and 99355 for an additional uh, 60 minutes and 90 minutes. Uh, they bill at an RVU of 2.33 and 1.77 um, for those of us that, that that matters to you as far as RVUs, um, but there's that. Um, I'll touch on this in like literally 10 seconds. This is my project. Um, we're trying to work on a better diagnostic, so we're trying to use um, helper T cells that have been identified uh, in conjunction with Benaroya, Virginia Mason, Seattle Asthma and Allergy. Uh, we're doing double blind challenges for peanut allergy specific and looking for markers of activation, which is CD154 and 137, which is CD40 ligand, um, TNF uh, uh, receptor, superfamily nine, which is another co-stimulatory activation, and then SD2, which is the IL-33 receptor. These cells are uh, specific to the allergen, but not present in non-allergic patients. They produce IL-5 and 13. Um, this is kind of what you see. Anything over right here, um, I'm sorry, right here, over 2% has been correlated with a positive challenge. It is not yet ready for prime time. It is something that is still, uh, we're trying to work on it in conjunction with other assays to, to do a better job, like the BST um, is like a catch net. Um, it is not yet there. And we're looking also longitudinally over oral immunotherapy patients. So I apologize that I'm going probably a minute or so over. Um, food allergies come a long way. We, we have learned a lot, but especially in the last year, we have more questions. Um, we need help from our, our primary care doctors for prevention of food allergies, education of our families. It can't just come from us. It has to come from, from them. Um, early ingestion is going to be the best thing for all, all families. And then um, we don't necessarily have to screen unless it's going to affect families not introducing at home. Uh, we should always consider oral challenges, um, especially in the sensitized, never exposed patients, especially for young patients. Um, we need to look a little bit more at what a positive, a true positive is, uh, and then there's more therapeutics coming down the line. So these are my references. I apologize that I went long. Um, this is the word of the day. I will take any questions. And like I said, I apologize that I'm a wordy person. <laughs> uh, Clint, just a quick question. Um, any any updates on palforzia with you know pre-treating with omalizumab or dupilumab as far as more rapid induction of tolerance and better safety? Great question. So um, they haven't they haven't pushed out the the com the combination trial with dupilumab and um, palforzia. Uh, they haven't put out the data. It does it seems promising. It makes sense, um, but the data has not yet been pushed out. And even with the dupilumab, they didn't try to make it more rapid. They tried to decrease the side effects. Um, 
So they, I do not believe they've looked at a more rapid way. I will defer from the research side that may be slightly different, but um, they have not specifically looked at more of a rapid desensitization. Glenn, thanks. Um, I don't have a question, but I have so, two general comments. One, this is becoming so complex that we're gonna have people within our specialty who just do food allergy, don't do the rest of our specialty. Yes, sir. Um, and the other comment, it strikes me that this is an issue of affluent people in our society. I <laughs> would imagine that in lower socioeconomic situations, communities of color, this is, except for life-threatening anaphylaxis, that this just doesn't happen. This is just uh, too much, too expensive. That's, that's too, not too necessarily the case. So the African-American African community inside um, the United States is equally affected, if not more affected, to food allergy. Um, and it's just less, they, they, have, they seek less medical care from an allergist. Um, and so they're less likely to, to be longitudinally followed. Um, outside of the United States, you are absolutely correct. It does appear that it is a developing country uh, issue or developed country issue, whereas you don't see it in, in Thailand um, where they have you know, a much more kind of broader use of legumes or, or in India where they use legumes, uh, lentils, everything else much more regularly. You don't see the same kind of rate. And that may be because they have earlier introduction either due to exposure um, everything like that, or a, a level of you know survival of the fittest, where an individual with a peanut allergy that lived in a country that consumes peanuts on a regular basis probably would not survive, and it would not be of a survival benefit. No, but I was saying even in our society, yes, Afri African Americans probably have this condition as frequently as Caucasians and Asians and other races, but whether they get access to the complexity of what you just discussed. If that translates to inner city America, I'm, I'm skeptical that this is offered and done. They're, they're going to be getting palvorzia and dupilumab is just unrealistic. You're absolutely correct. So, and there was um, in January in Jack in practice, they did talk about health disparities in the food allergic patient. Um, I did not have time to cover that, but that is something that is, is being looked at as well. Other questions from those of you who do a lot of food allergy? Maybe just one brief one. Uh, short of practice parameters, has anyone sort of editorialized, gone out on a limb and said, you know, we should extrapolate the LEAP data to tree nuts for, for obvious reasons? <laughs> so um, Bob Woods group says, says maybe. Um, and same thing with the group out of, um, out of so the, the challenge with it is that if you look at out of the Colorado, there's kind of like two different polarizing people with uh, Greenhot and uh, Fleischer. Right. Um, mm -hmm. where Fleischer is like, you know, we got to be more, more cautious and, and Greenhouse is like, just give it to them. It's fine. <laughs> um, and so there is a lot of exactly. conflicting data as far as all of that. Cause the tree nuts have been neglected. Fin fish has been neglected. Sesame yeah. has been neglected. So it, it's something that we don't have the data behind. We hopefully yeah. will. There are some people who are interested in looking at it, but we do not have the data. Yeah. I mean, anecdotally, I've certainly gone that direction with cashew, et cetera, it's just because they're often lifelong food allergies. And it, Absolutely. we'll see. It seems to be successful. I'm curious. Right. Um, it seems to me that the peanut product launched at obviously about the worst <laughs> time possible. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Or anybody trying to launch a product in this last year. But particularly, has anybody in our community used it? There, there is, um, so I know of at least one provider that is using it, um, and I've used it in conjunction with them at Northwest Asthma. Um, I don't know about some of the other locations, um, specifically, mainly because the more of the pediatric population goes to, to Northwest Asthma or to other locations uh, than U University of Washington outside of the Eastside Clinic. I do not believe we've started at University of Washington. Um, I do not believe um, Virginia Mason or anything, some of the other surrounding areas have, but I think that is, it is going to catch on for the right patient population. Um, and I think that there's a couple of trial patients that um, clinically have been started on it. Frank, do you know is anybody, we have patients at NAC on it? You do. I, I know of at least one. One. Well, that's not a great launch. It's, it's not. I'm not saying that it is, but I, I know of, 
I know personally of, of a couple that have been started on it clinically. Yeah, I don't know if that's a business model that'll succeed. All right, anybody else out there? All right, Clint, thank you for a very thorough uh, presentation. Sort of makes my head spin, but those of you who do food allergy, more power to you. Thank you all for, for joining in. If you guys have any questions, just let me know. All right, so we'll sign off here. Remember, next week we have two presentations um, back to back, uh, the second one on TSLP. All right, so long, Clint. See you soon. I'll join you on the other side. Yes, sir.